Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favour. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine and oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. But if that place is too distant and you have been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver and take the silver with you, and go to the place the Lord your God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink, or anything you wish. Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God, and rejoice. And do not neglect the Levites living in your towns, for they have no allotment or inheritance of their own. At the end of every three years bring all the tithes of that year's produce, and store it in your towns so that the Levites, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, and the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns, may come and eat and be satisfied, and so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel the loan they have made to a fellow Israelite. They shall not require payment from anyone among their own people, because the Lord's time for cancelling debts has been proclaimed. You may require payment from a foreigner, but you must cancel any debt your brother owes you. However, there need be no poor among you, for in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you, if only you fully obey the Lord your God, and are careful to follow all these commands I am giving you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised and you will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. If there is a poor man among your brothers in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your poor brother. Rather be open-handed and freely lend him whatever he needs. Be careful not to harbour this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for cancelling debts, is near so that you will not show ill will towards your needy brother and give him nothing. He may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to him, and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-hearted towards your brothers and towards the poor and needy in your land. Anybody here remember bringing in the sheaves? Not the song, actually doing it. No, not even me. I'm not that old either. Um, I think it stopped a few years before I was born on our farm. We were in Dry Street 
Um, I have seen a binder and I've seen it work, and uh, but I've never brought them in. And so a lot of people haven't got a clue what bringing in sheaves means. And if you don't know what sheaves are, it's a machine that used to cut, it used to go on a band, uh, a rubber belt, and then it was tied up and it threw them off the back and then then you have to collect them all in, then bring them and stack them. And the, the mice used to, rats used to love uh, when you brought the sheaves in, because uh, when you um, when you came to thrash them, as I hear from my dad, they used to open up the stack and thrash the sheaves. Um, the old uh, the Cayley brothers used to come, used to have to um, tie their trousers around the bottom. All right, and if you forgot, it was in a problem. And one year, uh, my dad was there and he saw this tiny kid. I said, what's the matter with me? He said, a rat's got up my trousers, I can't get it. He's <laughs> come flying up there. So, um, there were quite sort of things. You know, farming's a little bit different these days. Um, when you bring in the sheaves, um, for some of the bigger farmers, you use a half a million combat pound combine. Because farmers are all rich and they can all afford half a million pound combines, um, which is used for six weeks of the year. But you can't do it without it. Um, vast majority of farmers, farmers in this country are still small ones, small farmers, and I think uh, I think there was something like 30,000 farmers went out of business last year. Um, so they're going out desperately quickly um, because it is more and more difficult to um, to make a living. I shan't go on my hobby horse uh, and say about it because my wife's saying, pack it up, pack it up. <laughs> um, but farms have to diversify, and I think you've seen some of the um, uh, programs on television about this farm in life and our Yorkshire farm. Um, farmers are very good at diversifying. I actually work for a small farm um, now part time um, who've gone out, of, they can't make a, a proper living out of selling milk wholesale, so they have to go into, um, they've gone into retail selling of milk, uh, but not only real milk, they do yogurt, cheese, milkshakes, and this and, and they've managed to survive and they're doing quite well as far as sales are concerned. Um, but um, people have to diversify, do all sorts of things. Um, there's deer and there's ostriches and, and things. So, um, but there's always been a harvest. This year's been particularly difficult. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, only 60% of uh, the winter corn was sown it was supposed to be, and yields are down in the region of area of around about 40%. Um, so, in other words, there's like a 50% less corn cool this year than it was last year. So that will inevitably mean higher prices. Um, so I'm afraid just to warn you there, things will be a bit more expensive this year when it comes to uh, that sort of thing. But there's always been a harvest. It might be low in one area, but there's higher in another. It might be uh, um, famine in one, one part of the world, but God has said there will always be a seed time and harvest. And we thank God for that. And so let's just have a moment of prayer before we look at our message. Uh, and just to thank God for his goodness. Father, as we've come to give thanks to you, we do thank you that you said there will always be a seed time and a harvest. And Lord, we thank you for this wonderful world that you've given to us. Sadly, so often uh, we misuse it. I pray that you will help us uh, to, to do the right thing, that we may think about our environment, that we may uh, just do the right thing. Lord, we know that everything is in your control. And Lord, that the end is is under your control but Lord help us to play our part help us not to misuse uh, what you've given to us Lord you've uh, given us the the animals that the land to be used for our benefit but Lord we are supposed to take care of it and I pray that we may do that and Lord I pray that you will help us to think about those that are in need Lord to take care of them too and so as we come now to to look at this word I pray that you will guide our thoughts that you will direct our minds to what it is you want us to understand and be with us. We ask this in your name. Okay, we've um, uh, asked to come to your harvest this morning, and that's really good. And, and we've, and as our church is a little bit small, we'd have to have sort of like, before everybody could meet together, have three harvest festivals. So we've decided not to do one uh, as a church service. We've decided to do it, uh, have a, a thing about the LCM online, and then we're going to. Um, sends uh, money to to the LCM as where most of our our goods go uh, goods go and I just like to look this morning at the subject of offering to God as I said this weekend is your harvest and it's a, and the service uh, today is a time where we traditionally we can bring gifts of produce together 
and, and set it out in the front here to symbolise our thanks to God for his goodness uh, to us in supplying our needs over the last year. You know, the gifts are then, in many churches, taken from the front and then used to help those who are in need in our society. And yours is going to love. Like part for local homeless. Like, like the local homeless. Really difficult to hear people when they're talking about <laughs> this crazy. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's one in your local area. Now, having been involved in agriculture and coming from a village church, I remember the Harvest Festival of the Pulse where at the front of the church in which I grew up, it was packed with um, fresh fruit and vegetables that had been grown by various members of the church. And I'm sure that perhaps some of you can remember those times, yeah? Yeah. Uh, and really, when it came to tinned and packet foods, there were probably hardly any there. Well, our services today, things change. Many har harvest festivals are a little different. When it comes to our harvest festival, we ask the LCM what they would prefer to have to be able to use for those who are in need in, in, uh, in London or what have you. And so when it comes to fresh fruit, we hardly have any. Um, it's mostly uh, tinned and packet good foods and things that will help the homeless. Because, um, to be honest, a lot of people don't know how to cook fresh fruit. Uh, fresh food but um, so today things have changed and uh, very perhaps very few people grow their own vegetables etc although there's been a little increase in, in activity due to environmental and economic pressures this year and the effects of the pandemic who started gardening for the first time anybody are you all gardening down here anyway uh, but um, lots of people all, all the allotments have gone uh, near us in Corringham um, mind you, they always do after a certain certain area. They go and then after about two years, they all fall into disrepair and then another lot comes in. Uh, because um, growing vegetables and gardening is, is hard work. Uh, you don't just put a packet of seeds in, that comes everything in, everything's rosy. It takes a lot of hard work and effort. Um, as it said in our first reading, um, to, to uh, Cain, you're not going to be able to grow food so easily now, basically, he said there. And um, so the Harvest Festivals are different, aren't they? And um, today, most, most Harvest Festivals, many Harvest Festivals, there's a lot of uh, packaged food and tinned food uh, and money as given as tokens of uh, thanks to God. But does that matter? You know, sometimes we think, oh, it was really nice, and yes, the displays are great as they used to be, but it doesn't matter. What's the point of bringing something which is not properly used? Why don't we bring things that are right? Because it doesn't matter, provided the attitude with which those gifts are given is the right attitude. So this morning, if I asked you, do you have the right attitude of heart towards the things of God and the gifts that perhaps you gave this weekend, what would your honest answer be? Now in that passage in Deuteronomy that we read, God gave the Israelites instructions on what to do with the produce or harvest they had been blessed with that year. Now society was different in those days. The vast majority of people were involved in the provision of their own food, either growing it or tending flocks. And God has said that at certain times of the year, his people were to bring a percentage of those crops and bring them as an offering to the Lord and to the Levites, who were not involved in the food production. And it was to be brought for their use and for use amongst the poor and the needy. And that, in effect, is what our harvest festivals are about today. But what I want us to really take on board this morning is to think about uh, is what it costs God's people to be obedient to his commands. And are we prepared as a people to follow those principles today? You know, in Deuteronomy, in verse uh, 22, it said the people were to bring a tenth of all that their fields produced to a place designated by God. If that was not practical because it was too far away, then they could exchange the gifts for money and use that to buy goods nearer the place of offering. 
Not only were they to give a tenth of what they'd been blessed with each year, every seven years there was to be a year of cancellation of debts amongst the kinsmen. Now this is where if you were perhaps a person who'd been exceptionally blessed by God and had spare money, that you had lent to someone who was in need, then in the year of cancellation you were to cancel their debt whether it had been fully paid up or not. Wouldn't that be great if the banks and the building societies adopted that sort of system today? Anybody up for it? <laughs> Sadly I've paid my mortgage off so it won't be so much but but it would be great. You know, I, I tell you, if that was still the case today, we certainly wouldn't be bombarded with all those letters and adverts from people trying to get us to take out loans and credit cards. Especially, and especially when it got near to the year of cancelling debt, you wouldn't see them for dust, would you? But you know, even that sort of attitude of not wanting to lend is addressed uh, by Scripture. Because in chapter 15, verse uh, 7 to 9 uh, and 8 says if your brother is in need then you are to help him out and don't be tight fisted the reason that God gave these instructions to the Israelites was as it said in Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 4 it says however there shall be no poor among you uh, for in the land the Lord your God is giving you as you possess your inheritance he will richly bless you, for there shall be no poor among you. You know, there are many poor in our society today, and there are people who are in need, but God had a mind for those people, and that's why he sent these things in. But you know what? There was still a condition to be met. The Israelites would only be blessed only if they fully obeyed God's commands. In fact, if you look carefully in the instructions given, the Israelites seems that they were uh, that the percentage to be given over the years wasn't ten percent. We so often we'll hang on to this. Oh well, the Israelites give ten percent, so therefore we should give ten percent. If you look into it, uh, and I'll challenge you to look into it, it works out that they were nearly giving nearly thirty percent a year, not ten percent. Thirty percent. For those in need. The government obviously takes money from us and probably, I don't know, somewhere for those who have to pay around about 25-30% and those who manage to work their ways around it, see Steve about that, um, <laughs> um, probably a little bit less. But, you know, God's knew that you probably need to put away about 30% to take care of those who are uh, as well as yourselves in society are in need. God was far above in front of us. The society in us today, uh, us today, perhaps the principles set forth in Deuteronomy are completely alien and will be really hard to follow. But when we look around the world today, we can see that really that sort of attitude is what is needed by us. You know, the distribution of wealth in the world is totally out of balance. In crude terms, something like the richest 10% of the world's population, the richest 10% of the world's population, own over 80% of the world's wealth. That leaves 90% of the population with less than 20% of the world's wealth. Hardly seems fair, does it? You know, in case in point, and I'm not picking on them as individuals, but we have people like Jeff Bezos from Amazon. He's the richest man, quote, in the world at something like 200 billion pounds to his personal fortune. Uh, Bill Gates, I think about 90 million. Warren Buffett, 80 billion. And he's a financer. The incomes from their companies in the past are more than the income from some small countries. That sort of wealth for one individual is really unimaginable, isn't it? Now please don't think I'm picking on them, but it seems when there's a great, great disparity. So why has it gone wrong? Well, it's because we've not taken God at his word. It has come about because of what we read in Genesis chapter 4. 
You know, in that passage, we see that Cain and Abel both brought an offering before the Lord. We aren't told what the offerings were to be, but we are told a little bit about the offerings that they brought. Cain and Abel had different professions. One was a farmer, the other a, she uh, other, um, a shepherd. And as such, they had different gifts to bring before the Lord. Now verse 4 tells us that Abel, when he brought his offering, he brought fat portions from some of the firstborn in his flock. In other words, he went out and searched through his flock until he found some of the best animals that he had. He then brought those to the Lord and gave them to give as his offering. Now, Abel, I am sure, we can see, was truly thankful for what he'd been given. He knew what God had given him, uh, and God had given him far more than he could give back to God. But he wanted, but he wanted to show his thankfulness by giving the best that he had. But then in verse 3, we read this. See what Cain did, and it says, He bought some of the fruits of the soil. Now there may well have been some sort of thankfulness for what he had been given, and he was obedient, but I believe his attitude of heart was wrong. It seems that he just did it because he had to. No real heartfelt thankfulness, no real thought went into the act. It was almost as though anything would do as long as the appearance was right. But God is not concerned about the amounts we give to him. He's more in concern about the attitude behind our action than the acts themselves. If you want to look at the story sometime of the, the widow that brought her offering uh, to the Lord in the temple, and Jesus saw her giving and she gave two uh, mites. The reason they're called mites is because the English language never had a, had a, didn't have a word for something that small. A farthing was too much. So they called them mites. And they were the smallest coin that you could give. And she gave that. Basically, um, they were worth nothing. But the Lord said, she has given far more than those who have given out of wealth. You see, the Lord, our Lord God does not need or want our wealth. It wouldn't matter how much we give him, give to help the poor and the needy, because that amount, however vast it is, is nothing to God. As it says in the chorus, some of you might know it, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. They're his. God doesn't want our finances per se. What he wants is our obedience and our heartfelt uh, gratefulness and thankfulness with our gifts. No matter how small they might be, when given with the right attitude, God will do so much with them. But Cain couldn't see that at all. All he could see was the rejection of his offering by God. And like so many of us, when we fail, rather than deal with the problem in us, we often lash out and have to blame someone else. Cain allowed those feelings of resentment to grow to such a point that it ended with him killing his brother. If we're not very careful, the devil will take very small mistakes and problems, such as jealousy and rejection, which can so easily be dealt with by a change of heart. And he works on us until they become major problems and make our mistakes, which hurt and affect many others. Here for Cain, his resentment and rejection turned to sadly turned to murder. But the murder of Abel is not the point I want to major on this morning. It's what Cain said in verse 9. But verse 9, in reply to God's question as to where Abel was. God said, where is your brother Abel? And Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? And by that reply, Cain was showing the real nature of his heart. There was a callous indifference as to the whereabouts of his brother Abel. He himself was all right, so why should he worry about anybody else? And that, sadly, is the attitude that is so prevalent in society today. Thankfully, in the last um, six months or so, we've seen some of that change. Whereas people care about others, a lot of people in society care about others. We've seen that with 
the selfless, uh, selflessness of the, those who work in, in the, the frontline uh, protection services and the NHS and what have we. We've seen neighbours caring about others. But we've also seen, I'm all right, I'm going to look after myself. Who's been to the shops since the things started to get a little bit more tricky in the last week? Had a job get toilet rolls? No, no. no, well, round our way, the shelves, stuff was, the knees went in on Friday and stuff was flying off the shelves left, right and centre. They haven't learned by the last problem where there was plenty of stuff to go round, it's just a panic buying had ruined it. And that attitude is still there. But there are, is thankfully, uh, people are thinking about other people. And we pray that that may continue. Well, an answer to the question that uh, uh, Cain was asked, am I my brother's keeper? Whether we like it or not, the answer to that question is yes. Each one of us has a duty, not only to our brothers, i.e. our family, but also to our neighbours and our fellow countrymen and to the citizens in all other parts of the world, especially when they're in need. Hence the need for projects like the LCM Homeless, uh, your uh, local food uh, bank and other food banks and perhaps other local projects. And then there's relief and aid programmes in various parts of the world. Sadly, society tends to think that we have the things that we do have and the standard of living in this country because we work for it. And yes, work does very often play a part in how we get on. But that's not the whole answer. God, for whatever reason, has truly blessed us in this country. So much so that in this, our, our country, we're in, in the Western world, have a great deal of this world's good. But it is not through our own doing. It's through God's goodness. Consequently, I believe that it's our duty to use those gifts that we have, not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of others who are not so blessed as we are. Take for example, God has promised that there will always be a seed time and a harvest. And that promise has never failed. Oh yes, at times it's desperately severe and it's definitely hard in certain places and there will be parts of the world where there isn't a harvest. Maybe not a seed time. But at the same time in other parts of the world there are bumper harvests. There is plenty of food to go round for all to be satisfied. What there isn't enough of is the will to put that into practice. You know, we as individuals are often so engrossed in making sure that not only our immediate and future needs are met, but sadly we often turn a blind eye to the needs of others in the part of the world. The result of that is many people in other parts of the world go without any of their basic needs being met because of our selfishness. I mean, in the 70s and early 80s, we had the food mountains. Remember those, some of you, the older ones? Food mountains, where we had grain stored in all parts of the, uh, the Western world, uh, great big heaps of grain, um, butter mountains, uh, oil mountains, or oil lakes, and this, that, and the other. And it got to a point where, to keep things sustainable, they were taking this food and dumping it in the sea. Perfectly good food, dumping it in the sea rather than give it to people in other parts of the world who are in desperate need. Crazy situation. Sadly, we don't have the food mountains, but we still do have uh, similar problems where people, the people who are in need aren't getting the things that they want. But God said, when it came to helping others, we should be, uh, verse, read, do verses 7 to 11 in our reading. He said, if there is a poor man among you, your brothers in any part of the town or the land that the Lord your good has given you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your poor brother. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend him whatever he needs. Be careful not to harbour this wicked thought the seventh year, the year for cancelling debt is near, so that you do not show ill will towards your needy brother and give him nothing. He may then appeal to the Lord against you and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to him. No, we should not lend, lend on the basis of want, but on the basis of need. We should give our plenty to help people's basic need. And what a revolution that will be in society. If they've not been able to pay it all back in the year of cancelling debts, 
it would be written off. Now, I know there are major difficulties with this when it comes to deciding need as opposed to the corrupt want of some. And to some extent, Western governments uh, have gone a little way down the road of cancelling third world debt. But what about you and I as individuals? How thankful are we for what God has blessed us with? And what are we doing with it? Have we got the right attitude of heart? Are we generous to those around us and give of our plenty with which God has blessed us to help those who are in, around us in need? Well, I do trust that we do play our part. But you know, it's just not the end with being blessed with this girl's world's goods. When it comes to cancelling debt, God has cancelled another debt for some people. It's a huge debt. A debt that we could never pay. It's the debt of sin. When it comes to sin, there is only one price that could be paid for it, and we ourselves could never pay it. The sinless Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice of his life upon the cross was the price that needed to be paid. Nothing else was or is good enough. But through his death, our debt to God can be cancelled. But only if we repent and accept that gift. But what are we doing about that gift that God offers to us and has given to some of us? I'm sure that if those of us who have a mortgage were contacted by the bank or building society and told that they decided, decided to cancel the rest of the mortgage we uh, had with them, we'd be over the moon. Wouldn't we? Don't sound very convinced. I would. <laughs> I would like to pay it off now, but I would have been. It would have been great. The thing is, God has answered a far greater debt for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. So I trust that if we've not done so, we will have accepted that gift of salvation. And when we have done that, we will tell others of his amazing goodness to us. God's given us so much in this world of this world's goods. But God wants to give us that gift of salvation. But only if we will be obedient and accept him. Verse 10 of Deuteronomy 15 says, Give generously, generously and God will bless. And he does that with our natural needs, but he will do it so much more when we tell him his goodness to us through his salvation. So I trust that we will thank God for his goodness to us, that we will give of our, our uh, things that we've been given to God and, and we think of those who are needy in society and we will give generously and do not be tight-fisted tight because God wants to bless us and when we, go, we do give uh, out of a thankful heart, God does bless us and he blesses us so much more. Can we sing our last song, well, can we follow our last song uh, this morning? That's Come Ye Thankful People Come. <laughs>